Okay, and we are live today on YouTube. Um, I'm going to turn that off. So for those who are already logged in, just give us a few seconds to let others join and then we'll get started. <clears throat> if you are already in the chat room, just let us know whereabouts you are currently joining and logging in from. Oh, so we have a few more that have logged in. So I think we can get started because we are live um, and things are happening. So I'll just set us up live um, and do the introductions. At the moment, we've only got one person chatted in that's figured out how to do so. Um, and I'm sure others will start joining us. So first of all, no my haremai to the second um, prevention webinar of Toanes Tuiwi Caucus. Today we are very lucky to have not one, but two guest speakers. Um, a little surprise for us out of, the, um, out of the blue, and it was a surprise for me too. So um, I'd it is my absolute pleasure today to invite and welcome two amazing women um, to our webinar and introduce them to the sexual violence sector. Um, so to your the right of your screen is Dr. Heather Kame. If you can give us a wave, Heather. Um, and Dr. Heather Kame has worked for nearly 25 years in the health promotion sector and in Māori Health as, and has had a long involvement in social justice and activism within Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, she's one of the founding members and co-chair of STIR, which is Stop Institutional Racism, and that it was also a key part of her PhD, which is a beautiful document which I recommend everyone to read. And um, it's currently one of a senior lecturer for um, Te Pua Waiora Māori Health Research in at Auckland, um, Auckland University of Technology. Got my tongue twisted for a moment. Um, and uh, at the moment, she was a really core person in the research around the Health Promotion Forum that was connected to Te of Waitangi, which will be part of the presentation today. And joining her today is um, Susan De Silva, who has a long-standing involvement with um, the network Waitangi Whangarei, and also has a long-standing involvement within the domestic violence sector and is currently a, a social worker for Whangarei Boys High School, as well as being Heather's sister-in-law. So um, I will very delightfully hand over to both these wonderful people and I hope you enjoy their, their presence and their information as much as I usually do um, when I learn from them. So thank you. Well, uh, Miriam, thank you um, for that welcome. Um, kia ora tātou, um, nā mihi nui, nā rangatira mai, nō mai haere mai, um, he tangata triti ahau, he ko whangarepo te awa awa, ko taranaki te maunga, i tupu aki ahau ki runga i te ngāti wai whenua, kei whenua te te kawarawa maki tōku kainga e nai nei, ko Dunning, Rato, ko Kane, ko Smith, ko Lang o ko hapu, ko Morris came rawa, ko Patricia Smith o ko mātua, ko Dennis came fra tino pai tako ho rangatira. Ko Heather came fra tako ingoa nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Susie's um, going to chip in when she wants to. Yes, I'm riding shotgun. <laughs> all right, all right. So Susie's chipping in whenever um, she fancies, which is excellent. Um, Oh yeah, I think that um, I concur with what um, what Miriam said. I'm at AUT and um, yeah, and writing a lot about Te Triti and about institutional racism and critical um, policy analysis is my little corner at the moment. Um, this is um, some of my Fano, the one with um, the. Blue stars are my um, granddads and great granddads um, from the um, famous team of 19, Rodney Cricket team from 1938. Um, it, was, it, it was the year my mother was born and it was their destiny um, for my mum and dad to meet, I think it's fair to say. And like many Pākehā families, um, my family sports mad, but one of the things that I've learnt 
from them is the importance of fair play. And from my perspective, te treaty is the um, terms and conditions by which my ancestors came to this country. So therefore, it's important how we engage with te treaty. So I'd like you to take a moment to think about why you think we should care about te treaty. It's like a mini break, isn't it? Um, <coughs> I would have asked you to respond in a different world, but it's tricky on the old webinar. But I think there's a range of reasons why we should. Part of why I care about Te Triti is that um, my goddaughter is from Napui. My um, nieces and nephews are Nati Maniapoto and Nati Fatua, and my grandchildren unexpectedly are Nati Kahanunu. So for me, part of honouring Te Triti is about the future and those crew, and it's also about honouring my ancestors so that the promises that were made in their name are honoured. So institutional racism is about a pattern of behaviour where one group of people get disadvantaged and another gets advantaged. It's about action and inaction and it's not about intent. And when you look at colonisation and assimilation, New Zealand has been going under, has been experiencing institutional racism since 1840. So when we see institutional racism, when we see inequitable outcomes and all of those things, we're seeing breaches of Te Treaty. So if you're honoring Te Treaty, usually you're not breaching. And usually you're not doing institutional racism. And this is the shameless promotion about our book. Um, if you Google, I'm sure you'll find it. And the good news is it's free. It's very affordable, isn't it, Susan? Very affordable. And we wrote this book because I was involved um, back in the day in the development of two hands, the Treaty Based Practice Guidelines and the, for the Health Promotion Forum developed. But um, we wanted something else, much more nitty gritty about how to do treaty based practice. And so we spoke to a range of senior health promotion practitioners and asked them how they did it. And the bunch of authors who are all STUI members um, reflected on how they worked with Te Treaty. And between us, we worked it out, I think, something terrifying that we'd maybe had 150 years' experience in the sector and working with Te Treaty. So it's quite a lot of things to draw on. Um, our book is dedicated to um, Rahapiti Ramston. And we did that because she's a legend. And because at the heart of cultural safety is about honouring Te Treaty. And we wanted to remind people of her work, which talks about sharing power and the importance of sharing power and reintroduce it into a new generation of people. So kia ora Rahapiti. Um, just by um, a technical points for the treaty fanatics in the crowd, um, um, he Whakaputanga is the um, Declaration of Independence that happened in 1835, which meant that Māori were recognised within the international political community as an independent nation. Te Treaty is the Māori text of Te Treaty, as signed by Hobson on the 6th of February, 1840, and as signed by the majority of chiefs and as recognized by international law. From my perspective, there is no other, you know, that is the version of the treaty, that is the one that has mana. The Treaty of Waitangi is the English version, which hardly anybody signed, and it says completely different things to the treaty. So I think of them now as separate documents. And when people talk about the principles, I always ask, which ones do you mean? Because I've personally found 34 different principles that Crown agencies and courts and such like have come up with. So there's a hell of a lot of principles and Mason Jury and others have been very clear that from a Māori perspective, what matters is the Māori text. 
So um, we've used in our book, we've used Margaret Mutu's um, translation of, of um, Te Triti. We recommend that if you feel like going shopping, want a bit of retail therapy, that you secure Napoi Speaks, which is based on um, the, the oral history of the people of Napoi around Te Triti, Māori language sources from back in the day and English primary sources back in the day. So it's an independent tribunal report based on the Napoi hearings, which we think is fabulous. When you agree, Susie. Well, yes, as we Susie published it. Susie, <laughs> Susie's group, um, Network Waitangi Whangarei, published it, so it would be only right that she would endorse the product. With um, Kawariki. Oh, Kapai, Kapai. And uh, on the bottom of the screen, it says Y1040, which is referring to the Waitangi Tribunal Report for the Napoi claim, which, of course, is the remarkable piece of um, New Zealand history where they recognise that Napoi never ceded sovereignty. That can do your head in a bit. How exciting is that? So there's the crew that we gathered stories from about how they worked with Te Triti. You'll probably know some of them. One of the crew didn't want to be identified, but all the rest are happy to show their faces and names. So that's pretty cool. You might know some of those people. I'll leave you to read about them in the in our book. But um, we think that often, I think, that often people get a bit lost about Te Triti when they think, when um, they just think it gets it's too big and too hard. And one of the ways you can make it easier to work with is to look at it in its parts. Which isn't to say that you can, you always need to think of it as a whole. But if you look at the parts, it kind of makes it easier. So in the preamble of the Te Triti of the treaty, Te Triti, people talk. It's about so it's about the intent of the, of the British Crown and Hapu to have a relationship. And obviously their intention is to have a good relationship, or they wouldn't probably have bothered writing it down. And so bringing to the table what we know about how to have a good relationship, whether it be from our personal life or our professional life, is kind of really useful in the context of treaty work. Um, I'll leave you to read some of the, the words on the PowerPoints for another time, but we'll just look at what Grace said, which I think is quite poetic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From, one, from the study. She goes, if it, it's a bit like if you listen to the piano and it's a piece of bark and it has four tunes all running along together. If you listen to the bass, you have to listen carefully to the bottom tune because the top tune will always be in your ear. So it's about that really deep listening and trying to be um, the best you can be in the relationship. And certainly, if you ask for advice, then comes the obligation to often to take the advice. So mm. that's a little trick for young players, isn't it, Susie? It is. So Article 1 um, talks about granting governorship of to the British of their subjects. So it's quite a limited delegation of middle management, really. Yes. And Sandra explains it's like being in a rental situation, that it's like you get to be the tenant rather than the landlord. And that Māori have tino rangatiratanga and are the landlord and us Pākehā are the tenants. So there's definitely a tuakana taina mm. kind of situation mm. going on. We are the junior partner. We are not the boss of this business. Hopefully that makes sense. So there's a um, quote on the left, which is a um, technical thing that helps explain that kawanatanga was mm. about delegating that middle management to of the Pākehā folk. So when we spoke to our people, they came up with three kind of key areas about how they worked with Te Triti in terms of Article 1. And so that was thinking about decision making, so that's who was making decisions and how decisions were made. 
And so that's about who's at the table and who gets to mind or guide things in terms of kaitiakitanga. So often when people were working with kawanatanga, they were coming up with structural mechanisms to make sure there was Māori voice and control in what was happening. Yeah. And so should we, should we go with Sandra or Lucy? I like Lucy. Lucy. So this is Lucy, who's a public health physician, and she's, in her little quote, she's talking literally about who's at the table and if the wrong people are at the table, you cancel the meeting. Mm. Because nothing good will come of it if the right people aren't at the table. Pretty bold move. Mm. A little surrendering of power there, which is very irahapiti. Article 2, which of course is many of us' favourite article about tinoranga teratanga, about sovereignty. And obviously the meaning of it is contested, which is what our mate Helen Weehong is saying there. But um, when in doubt, always go to Moana Jackson because I've never known him to get it wrong. But And so he's saying Rangatiratanga was entrusted to folk to look after and to hand on for generations and that it's incomprehensible to give it away. So it's about that self-determination. So the role of non-Māori in relation to that is to, A, well, one of the way, one of our roles in this is to clear the way, is to do anti-racism work so that Māori can pursue their aspirations. Um, we was, you know, you never quite know where you go, where you're going to go to when you're having these deep conversations about the treaty. But where we went to was that if you can transfer power and resources to Māori providers so they can enact their tenoranga teratanga, because it's not really a Pākehā space. Mm. But if you can't do that, because we can only take action within our spheres of influence, and some of us have got bigger spheres of influence than others. But of course, we would always advocate for collective action. So if you join your sphere of influence with 14 other people, you've got a quite a big sphere of influence compared to Nigel Nomate's one person's sphere of influence. But if you can't transfer resources to Māori providers, try and work from a, from a Māori philosophical view. Try and do kaupapa Māori health promotion so that you can... Um, do something that you know is going to be useful and relevant to Māori. So um, Kitarangi, who um, is a public health practitioner in Taranaki, she talks about, you know, that her people would, ha would have none of it if it the work she was doing wasn't advancing te noranga teratanga. And I think that's a great challenge for all of us working in health promotion, public health and violence prevention is that how do we know our work is advancing tino ranga teratanga? And you only know that through dialogue. And you know, and so that immediately takes us back to the preamble. So it's kind yeah. of this whole circular going back and back to relationships and back to listening and back to sharing power and who's at the table and all of these sorts of things. And just in contrast of time there from Kitarangi that if it doesn't advance it immediately, it does eventually. I, and certainly some, you know, I think that Māori have a different sense of time mm. than non-Māori. Mm. And I certainly know of folk that do, they do planning and, you know, I might plan for five years, but the crew plan for 60 years. I've known hapū to have 60 year plans, mm. which just mm. does my head in. But sometimes you've got to be in for the long game. Though I refuse to take for us to take 60 years to end institutional racism. So Article 3 is the one that I think the health sector's embraced the most keenly. And that's about, well, literally about riti, about, about equity. And that needs to recognize that we don't all start from the same place. And that if we give have a universal service, we've got a service that increase that maintains or extends inequalities. 
And if we have a tailored service, we've got the best chance of having improved health outcomes. But the really courageous folk recognize that We've got this, we've got the big impact of this historical racism that needs to be fixed. Yeah, as shown in the famous picture. Quite easy to knock that over, really. Yes, knocking it over would be beneficial. Mm. So people went in interesting directions again in terms of thinking about Aritanga. They um because for me. It will end for some of the crew. It's about ethical practice. Ethical health promotion, public health practice involves engagement with Tutriti and it involves the pursuit of equity. And if you're not doing that, your practice potentially is not ethical. And as I said, you know, in terms of the health promotion and public health sector, we're not fabulous at evaluation. I say that as someone that's taught our valuation. There's great opportunities to strengthen practice but we need to make sure we determine whether things are increasing or decreasing equity and so evaluations need to address that which often means doing an ethnic analysis to see whether it works for Māori and the determinants of health are of course a, a surprise appearance here and they're there because often there's bigger forces at play than the particular health issue that we're funded to work on. So when I used to work in sexual health, the choices that people made in relation to sexual health came from a wider context than a wider history. And that you had to deal with some of those issues around people's decisions, you know, where they were with their mental health and their alcohol and drug use to unravel some of that stuff. Mm. And if, if our business is about supporting people to take control over their health, the determinants of health need to come into play and we need to take an holistic view whenever we can. Um, Sione, um, who's um, a Tongan practitioner, had something beautiful to say. Um, I can't read it because of where the thing is. Oh, one moment, please. Here we go. I know if my practice is aligned with the articles of Te Triti, I know that me and my fellow human beings will lead a healthier life. The whenua will lead a healthier life as well, and we achieve our life-given purposes. We will divide up our resources fairly. We won't fight. We will actually enhance each other, and we will achieve a lot more. Mm. I think that's a really beautiful and profound thing that Sione said. And it's like, if you're kind of living a ticker life and, you, and your practice is ticker, then you're creating health and well-being. And when you deviate from that, that's when you get into trouble, I think. Um, Article four isn't often talked about, but it's, I think it's from, you know, the feedback and the dialogue I've had with Māori, it's, in, it's incredibly important. So, it's about recognizing that everything's got a Māori, Modi. Everything's got a life force. And that spirit matters. And you see it all the time in Māori public health practice and, and in Māori health promotion. You see it less in generic health promotion. So the challenge for those of us that come from a Pākehā space is to find out and get in touch with our spirituality, whatever it looks like, and I'm not necessarily advocating for a religious spirituality, to find a way to normalise spirit in your work. And it can be through karakia, it can be through singing, it can be through practising manaakitanga, and a whole lot of different things. Um. Kitarangi once again comes up with a sound bite. Kirunga kiraro kiroto ki waho, ho pai mariri. We are a spiritual and heavenly peoples, and we must conduct ourselves in that manner for all of time. Mm -hmm. So, for me, some of this is, you know, I have aspirations for one day being a crone, 
and behaving immaculately. And I've got a bit much rage and rough edges to do that at the moment. But for me, it's about aspiring to be that well-behaved person that can work in a space where wairua is normal. And of course, we know that um, te reo me ono tikanga is a pathway into a culture. So at some point, you need a base knowledge of that to be able to do some of this work. You don't have to become a fluent speaker, but you need to, you need to cease and desist mispronouncing Māori words, and you need to know some basic tikanga. Mm. And tapu and noa are about the sacred and the non-sacred and that's the at the heart of Māori public health practice and 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 it's very closely connected with wairua tanga and it's again useful skills to have and to understand to be ready to be able to apply in your practice and I'm sure it fits powerfully in the context of violence prevention. Well, Mason Jury said that tapu and noa equated to dangerous and safe mm. and he was talking about about domestic violence where you go and um yeah, there's some quality items there so when you pull it back together to think about the whole for for a non-maori i think it's about being an ally so it's recognizing that once you know what happened in this land that there's responsibilities to then take action so working out how to be an ally and then just making a start and this work is about decolonization and it's about power sharing. And so you need to look at where power resides and how you can unravel that. And for some of us, that can be uncomfortable, but that's how it is. And sometimes things won't work, but as um, Susie always says, you have a go you reflect and you have another go. You normally get it wrong having had a go. Yeah. And so maybe you make new mistakes if you're going to make mistakes. But if you've got the right crew around you, you can minimise the amount of mistakes. Mm. And then we've got a little quote here from Queenie. Yeah, that's sweet. This is quite a beautiful one from 1994. Whatever may have happened in the past... And whatever the future may bring, it remains the sacred duty of the Crown today as in 1840s to, to stand by the Treaty of Waitangi to ensure that the trust of the Māori people is never betrayed. So that's the challenge, mm. is, is, is mm. trust is at the heart of this. How do we be safe treaty partners, a reliable, trustworthy and effective? So um, this is... Um, a random slide. Um, I found this and have been using this in talks lately. On the left hand side, you've got someone with not much control and heaps of concern. And on the other side, you've got someone with lots of control and not much concern. And in the middle is the sweet spot. Well, it's great they've got so much influence. I don't know whether it is the sweet spot really, but no. But it's interesting because I think lots of Māori are standing in the place in the left-hand side where they've got very little control and lots of things to be concerned about. So if we can use our influence and control to help make change, um, Kate the Pie, that's a good thing. When I showed this to um, a board of a DHB, some of the board <coughs> members, well, no, to be fair, a chief financial officer thought that he was in the special place on the left-hand side he failed to recognize the control and influence he had <laughs> he was blind to his own privilege so don't underestimate what doors you can open and what connections you can make um, to advance this work on oh, these my best tips five cents it's a bargain isn't it so yeah. see, it's a bargain so make it's friends at least six Make friends, make and nurture relationships. Make sure that you haven't got a rela your relationships with Māori aren't one way. So do some reciprocity. Don't always take, give as well. And there's a hundred ways of giving. You might be surprised at what is useful. Whenever you can, share power and resources. Um, I remember um, 
one of my mates was at something and she was um, talking about meeting me in treaty work and she remembers you know and it was 20 something you know it's 20 25 years ago and she said I'll never forget you know we were sort of working on a program together and Heather said okay um, I'd quite like 50% of the budget how much would you like and we had a conversation and I think I walked away with 50% but maybe they got 75 I don't really remember but the thing the point of interest was she'd never had a conversation like that where people thought about sharing that much of the stuff and actually if we're trying to do deal with equity I probably should have only asked for 25 percent but <laughs> so be it well but when you can when you can do and it's what's in our sphere of influence so support body aspirations so if the senior Māori person wants that, make that happen. Don't try really hard to not undermine Māori leadership. So it's a bit of a tight work, walk at times, but you want to be on the same side. So listen to the advice. It might not be clear to you about why that's the thing to do right now, but it might become clear in time, like Kitsurangi mm. explained. In fostering cultural good manners, well, that's about cups of tea, that's about kai, that's about turning up and not expecting people to always turn up at your office, but going to their office and going to their spaces and learning and being in Māori environments. And if you're going to do health promotion and public health work, go hard and create equitable outcomes. Yes. And if we're good at being a health promotion, public health person or a violence prevention person, we can do that. Oh, this is our group steer and um, we're a boutique social movement that's going to end institutional racism in the public health sector so um, wish us well look for out for us on Facebook if you want to join the gang become an associate um, at the moment we're working on all sorts of fabulous projects um, we're doing some evidence stuff for the Waitangi Tribunal we're about to write a critique of the government's um, report they sent to the in the universal periodic review to the UN we're writing up stories of racism. We're going hard. Oh, and then if you want to come and come to Court Northland, to Taitokoro, um, me and Susan and Miriam are hosting an anti-racism masterclass that starts on Friday night, goes to Sunday lunchtime. And we come up with a, we've got a tailored program that starts where people are at and we um, all, we just get on with it, don't we? It's good fun, good kai very affordable well, there's me i've got like eight followers on twitter and i'm keen to get the ninth if anyone's out there wants to join my little twitter community and then that's the last slide nice. which is the opening slide for the conversation kia ora well done oh thanks susan very nice enjoyed that okay miriam Kia ora. Um, can everyone hear me? Well, I can. Yeah. I can. I've just um, hidden my um, computer, my video, but we'll leave it at that. So for those who um, are in the chat room and want to send through some messages around questions that you have and <clears throat> information that you want, please let us know. Type it through now and um, we'll have a conversation with the two presenters. Firstly, thank you. Um, I'm just checking one thing because it seems that we've just had a little crash, but we might be back up, sorry. Um, thank you so much, Heather and um, Susie. It's always a pleasure listening to both of you. And um, for me, the kind of key pieces that I use in my practice um, that I've gained from both of you is that um, that we're going to get it wrong, but that doesn't that shouldn't stop us from trying, and that's always a, a really key key message of making sure that I continue as well in my process of growing and um, the importance of relationship and not undermining Māori leadership. So those are kind of some of my always key takeaways from when I hear the conversations with you. Um, are there any specific questions that you would like to ask the group? Like, is there any curiosity from your end towards the group just to make it a bit more interactive? 
Oh, well, we'd love to know how they're working with you, Treaty, if anyone's got a story. Okay, let me just open up YouTube again because things seem to have crashed on my other computer. So the question for the group is, how are you working with Te Tiriti or Waitangi? Let's see what comes through. Or how you intend working. Oh, yeah, right. that's a good question. All right. So firstly, um, we did have Let's some, so just a, a, to let or you both you know. Working. All right. That's a good question. All right. So firstly, um, so just to let you know who is actually in the chat as well, we have some youth services from Swanson, we have some people from Wellington and Nelson, um, as well as um, people from Tamaki Makoro. So there's quite a range of people in the chat as well. So that is great to hear. And we don't have any questions yet, but we do have 21 people watching, 22 people watching right now. So maybe they're just gearing up their questions. All right. <laughs> you want to say a bit about, because you've, um, Susie's been at um, North Tech for a long time, but she's now gone to a, a boys' school. A boys' school. How, do you, how does that, how does treaty application look like in a boys school how are you being a treaty worker in the boys school well well it's a very um traditional boys school and the names of the houses are gray marsden <laughs> bledisloe Ooh. that's all right we don't mind bledisloe <laughs> but we it, we the whole school is working to change the culture and we have people like mates and dates you know run by angie black and the her Dargaville crew they're in there we have a health center we I, I think changing the names is going to be a bit tricky with the old boys influence but some um, you know we're working on it one of the things that saddened me enormously as as the social worker in the health center there with a number of of maori kids who were coming over who sort of didn't need to be there they weren't being bullied or and i'd say well, you know, what are you guys doing here all the time and one of them said to me we like to hear our names pronounced properly hmm. what was that noise that's something on the internet Oh, so, you know, the bit about ceasing and desisting and mispronunciation is enormously important. Yeah. And you don't need an advanced serial qualification no. to pull that out no. of the bag, to be fair. A little bit of a tutorial. And and it depends, you know, I had no trouble going to Whanare because I hadn't grown up there. I still have trouble producing Topo, pronouncing Topo properly, because I used to go to a different place when I was a girl. And the places you're, you know, if you're familiar with something, it can be quite difficult to, to see it a different way. Mm. So we get it wrong. I suppose, as you were saying, it's also that, that piece of having a go, getting it wrong, and keeping on trying, even with pronunciation of you know, the importance is actually the commitment to trying and not just going, oh, well, I, I didn't pronounce it. I didn't pronounce taupo as, I used to pronounce it as taupo, so I'm just going to keep going like that instead of actually trying and, right. and, and having that commitment. Yes, yes, really important. Because we will get it wrong. I remember people laughing at me. Parker, of course, not Marley when I first started to use Kyora, and I, I remember my first recorded phone message being, yeah, ora. <laughs> Very careful, but totally wrong. I think, yeah, sort of, you, you do, you make the mistakes. It's a central part of learning. But the key thing is not to belt ourselves up about it or let anyone else belt us up. Mm. Um, probably a question I have in terms of like supporting and ensuring that Māori 
money aspirations and leadership are, are not being undermined and how to how to navigate that that piece when actually bigger players in the picture, for example, government and government legislation, might not have the same understanding of operating in a titiriti based way, or they might do it, but well, they might say they want to do it, but they don't do it. And and the role of Tawiwi in that space, if you have any advice or or reflections on that. Well, I think I think that, that the late Rob Cooper, I got to have a. I had a number of conversations with him, but at one particular one, I interviewed him for some research I was doing. And he said to me, um, what was what was my contribution going to be about ending racism? And what were my people prepared to give up to make that happen? And sometimes, like, it's really interesting to me the pickle that the nurses are in. So um, kia kaha to the nurses today that are out in the field. I don't know whether many of you know, but um, nurses that work in Māori health providers earn 25% less than nurses that work in district health boards. Mm. That has huge impact on Māori households. And there's a number of Māori health workers that are intergenerational. So there's been a number of them that have been in the same situation and been disadvantaged. Of you know, I can see a hundred ways that that could be fixed if um, what would happen if the nurses ah oh, gave some of their money to the other nurses share you know and yes we need to change the way the government does the contracting that's led to that situation but actually if people shared what we had they we could get more fairness straight away so there's quite you know there's layers of things that can be done because in some of the work some of the radical work that the Kawanatanga Network did in Hamilton, they came up with an alternative constitution, which is one of the most interesting pieces of treaty work that I've ever seen. And in that, they advocate for the end of um, private property and inheritance. Because that's part of how white privilege is perpetuated, is through inheriting land and, and money. And that, and that usually comes from the being the beneficiaries of colonization and then that privilege just gets passed on through inheritance so it's really mm -hmm. quite interesting about how how you can disrupt things but i think you've got to when you can name the racism name when things are off and do whatever you can within your sphere of influence obviously you're not yet the minister of health miriam but it doesn't mean you can't write to the Minister of Health or the Associate Minister of Health. Or, you know, when it's submission time, we can write our submissions, we can turn up to the public consultations, we can write policies that make room for the change that needs to happen. We can be kind. Thank you. And we've got a, a question from the from the participants that's just come through. So if there were three steps for people in an office um, that they could do towards honoring, honoring Te Tiriti or Waitangi and unraveling colonial and institutional racism, what would they be? Top three. Nice meaty question, thank you. From the... It's that bloody Nicola, isn't it? <laughs> it's not actually. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry Nicola. Um, three things three in the office. Well, oh, I'm curious whose office it is. Shall yes. we be in Jacinta's office? Jacinta's office. Yes. Yeah, so oh. are we taking that that you mean Jacinda's office? So what three things would we do in Jacinda's office? I'd have a I, I'd have a cultural supervisor. I'd have I wouldn't go out and hire a kamatwa. No, I think those days have gone. I mean that was that was a good good example of having a go but when I, I've been around a long time and some of the kamatua that um, institutions offices hired to do their their Māori thing were kamatua that suited the institution more than the um, local iwi really so I would be quite careful about developing whanongatanga I mean, you you have to have you have to know the people you're working with, 
And if you're serious about Fanongatanga, then you will know Māori personally as well as professionally. Aye. So because they come there to isn't your house. A, there isn't a difference between them. But come to your house. So you have Māori friends that you know and trust. Um because the you also have to be able to avoid the, the bullshit on both sides, really. Or if and if we're in Jacinda's office, of course, I'd be appointing Moana Jackson to be my chief advisor for the constitutional transformation of New Zealand and we'd be um, working on that project straight off the bat. But in an ordinary office. Oh, when I'm not in Jacinda's no, office? No, 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 you're in, you're in the um, Housing New Zealand. I would be kind to my Māori colleagues and like you you're saying I would form relationships with them and find out what they what they need what they need to make the workplace safer and try to start making that happen and I'd pick off one thing at a time and try and knock it off and I wouldn't get hung up on cultural practice I think that cultural practice is part of it but I've seen so often where it becomes all of it so cultural practice like sharing kai together. Oh, yes. Where possible, having morning tea, sitting down, getting away from your computer, sitting down and having lunch and morning tea together, because those are the times when you develop whanongatanga oh, yes. and inviting other people in, inviting um, people, your colleagues and different organisations to come and join you at those times. Oh, yes. That would be a good start. Because on Tuesdays at AUT South Campus, <coughs> if anyone's ever there on a Tuesday at noon on the second floor of MB building, we have vegan soup kitchens and we've got a roster and one of our crew makes soup and we put it on the old slow cooker and then we gather and we share their kai and we do we do karakia to bless the food and then we do whanaungatanga because usually there's someone we don't know that's come and we hang out. And that is part of how... I do treaty work at the office by building those relationships mm. and supporting my my Pākehā colleagues to build relationships with our team in Tapu Waiora. And it's a subtle little project, but it's absolutely about that thing about building building connection. You have to make the space for Wairua to make her way. Mm, mm. Um, a question I have, and it's more... Um, kind of know one of the answers so I'm I'm hoping that you'll share it with the rest of the group is um, some practical ways as you said before often people are blind or don't understand their own privilege or understand when they're racist or what's what's going on in particular when it's um, white folk and I'm wondering if you have some some practical ways of challenging racism in our everyday life in offices in government departments wherever we are with our with our beautiful families. With our beautiful families. Sometimes Oops. you can just say, what did you say? And they, when they repeat it, they sometimes think about what they're saying. All right. I think you have to avoid being snarky and you absolutely have to avoid the whole family game of point scoring because that doesn't get anybody anywhere. But asking them to repeat it is is sometimes very effective. And my mate Grant and I, Grant Bergen, when we've done treaty education together, we um he he invented this thing about the bread and butter voice, which I think is gold. And you just calmly use the same voice, despite you know you may have a range of feelings because when you witness racism, you know there's feelings. There's rage, there's anger, there's disappointment, there's a whole lot of feelings. So if you can step out of the emo that emotional space, if you've got the capacity to do that on the day, he encourages you to just calmly call it out in the same tone you would mm. when you're saying, can you pass me the butter? Mm. And one of the techniques that I use to varying mixed, mixed responses, I go... Oh, kia ora, I'm really uncomfortable with your racism. And then you can decide whether to stay and continue the conversation or just to walk away at that point. Because naming it is a political action. 
and staying and engaging as a political action, but also looking after Taking yourself your fights. is very critical too. Yeah. And I, I've, I don't know how many times in the last few years I've just said, oh, yeah, I'm not that comfortable with your racism. And it does seem to. But I think it's useful to talk about the racism in the system rather than the racism of yes. individuals yes. whenever you can, because then you can involve people in being part of the solution. And that's kind of powerful because you kind of want, we need as many hands as we can on deck for this work. And so having someone pissed off and sulking and out of action for five years because they didn't like how we challenged them isn't <laughs> helping us at all. So if you can get, if you've got the energy to get people on board, have a crack at it. But if you don't, just name it and walk away. Thank you. That was beautiful. And we've got one last question from the participants. So this is from someone who's working out in Swanson and says that I am Chinese and I work with at-risk Māori and Pacific youth. And I noticed that there are some similarities between our Māori and Chinese cultures, such as collective values and healing models. I'm kind of using them sometimes in building relationships with our young people. So any advice for me to better apply the titiriti in engaging our young people? Thanks. Oh, that's fabulous. That um, kia ora, because I'm out. We're out west too at the moment. We're in the Henderson Valley, so um, kia ora to our neighbour in Swanson. Mm. Um, I think absolutely draw on your own cultural traditions whenever you can in relation to this work. Mm. No one, no. I mean, when you, if you know, if I was ever at the marae with Miriam, the Komatua and crew would be so delighted if she suddenly started doing a song in Italian or did did a, her mihi in Italian. They love it when you know who you are and you bring your own culture. Mm. So I think it's a fabulous um, initiative that you're doing in terms of bringing your own stuff to the table. And the secret is to play to your strengths too, because different yes. people bring different things to treaty work. I'm I'm not illustrated it today, but I'm quite fun, can be quite funny, and so I bring humour into how I do things sometimes, and that's one of my strengths, and it helps me reach more people. Whereas Susie, you're the queen of. Manaki tongue, eh? and looking after people. Oh, that's nice. I'd like to be. And so, you know, so lots and lots of people come to Susan to get looked after, or Susan keeps an eye out for all of these people, and that's, you know, part of how she does it. And that's, and those different, there's different roles for different folk, and you find your strengths and you play to them. Mm. And um, that's great that you're drawing on your Chinese heritage. Yes, and you learn from each other. I'm thinking about a Chinese student I had who did the most lovely presentation and it was from Chinese philosophy. And she talked about it isn't just the things that are, but it's the spaces between them. And that was just spellbinding for me. I've spent a long time thinking about the spaces between them. I well, often it's the silence that's significant mm. too, you know, mm. and, and, and with cross-cultural things, it can have quite significant meanings, the silence. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's very exciting. Yes, and um, and that uh, feels like a really great place also to end in terms of thinking about the spaces in between and and what we can contribute to creating those spaces for others, in particular when we do have privilege and and. And sometimes our cultural paradigms take up more space within the system and, and what we can do to actively create those spaces in between for other cultures to emerge. And in particular, in honouring the Indigenous people of this land and ensuring that um, all of their wisdoms and cultural diversity and aspirations come forward. Oh, kia ora. So we, we might, I might just do, is it all right to do a little number? You can do whatever you want. It's your show. It's our show. It's our show. Just a sharing a Aotearoa Vision of Te Treaty on it Māori and Tawi Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. To you both. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us from many corners of this beautiful land. And with that, we will finish our live stream.